in today's video, we're going to talk about the top three failures on EJ255 Subaru engines. Starting at number one on the list, number one failure would have to be, in my opinion, the turbocharger. There are several uh, causes to why the turbo fails on the EJ255 engine. There is a banjo bolt that feeds oil from the engine to the turbocharger. Uh, the banjo bolt Subaru calls a union joint or a union bolt has a fine mesh filter uh, slash screen built in and over time this filter uh, screen in the banjo bolt uh, clogs up and when it clogs up it will starve your turbocharger of oil and that is the main cause of the failure on the turbochargers it is uh, from lack of oil to the turbo um, the main cause of this uh, clogging of this filter is due to in 2005 when this engine came out for US market Subaru took and put this oil filter on the engine this is the OEM oil filter for the EJ255 it's a very small oil filter the previous filter from Subaru for the uh, NA and turbo cars I don't have one on hand right now I'm actually out of stock on them all I've got are the newer filters is about double the size of this filter so in 2005 Subaru decided that they were going to start um, expanding uh, mileage recommendations and time recommendations between oil changes and the issue with that is uh, your oil if you run synthetic may continue to be good for longer mileage give protection etc but this filter has a finite amount of oil that it can filter and particulates that it can trap before it clogs and goes into bypass mode and no longer filters the engine oil after the filter has clogged and gone into oil the bypass mode then all the particulates and contaminants are going through your engine and they make their way to the banjo bolt where that small screen is and begin to clog the screen and starve the turbo of oil and that's where the turbo failures occur so how to prolong the life of your turbo on your EJ255 engine um, change your oil regularly I'd recommend 3,000 mile oil changes if you're gonna keep with the factory um, oil filter so change your oil more frequently especially during severe driving change your filter of course when you change your oil and as a uh, recommended maintenance you can well there's two ways you can go about it there's a lot of guys that remove the banjo bolt and completely gut the screen filter out of it and then you don't have to worry ever again about that clogging because there's nothing there to filter anything going directly to the turbo or I believe for about 15 16 dollars I think that's what the cost of that uh, Union bolt banjo bolt is from Subaru OEM from the parts counter if you change that every 50 60 thousand miles you don't really have to worry about it clogging and uh, starving your turbo of oil and you also get to retain your filtration to the turbo to protect it from any particulates that may get past your oil filter so number one on the list very common on the EJ255 engines usually happens between 100 and 150,000 miles is when I've seen the turbos go out but um, yeah turbochargers uh, I believe the OEMs are between sixteen hundred and two thousand dollars depending on when you get them uh, you can get some off-brand ones offline which I don't recommend for I don't know eight or nine hundred dollars but either way it's quite an expensive repair and if you let the turbo go out you might not just be repairing a turbo replacing a turbo you might be rebuilding your engine because sometimes when these turbochargers die it doesn't just wipe out the turbo it can uh, put metal shavings and trash back through the drain into your oil pan pick it up and go through the engine and wipe out uh, rod bearings main bearings um, 
score the pistons, score the cylinders, and then you're going to have an engine rebuild and a turbocharger to replace. So, cheap, effective, preventative maintenance. Change your oil frequently. Change it on time. Change your filter. And gut the screen on your banjo bolt or replace your banjo bolt every 50 to 60,000 miles and you shouldn't have the issue with your factory VF40 turbocharger on your EJ255 engines. Number two on the list for EJ255 common failures are, as we've all heard in the turbocharged Subaru community, is ringland failure or cracked ringlands. Um, this issue is where you have uh, basically the area between your piston rings here. You have a upper compression ring, a lower compression ring, and you have an oil ring underneath. But uh, the failure normally occurs between your compression rings or between your compression ring and oil ring. You'll get cracks in the area of the piston between the grooves where these rings sit. And these will either just remain cracks or you may have large chunks start to come out between your rings. Uh, when this happens, uh, you lose compression in that cylinder. You uh, run the risk of damaging the uh, cylinder bore from this piece of uh, piston being loose and uh, the friction it creates against the bore back and forth um, causes a lot of issues. Once it happens, you're looking at an engine rebuild. Um, why do your ringlands crack? Why do you have ringland failures on the turbocharged Subarus, the EJ255 and 257 primarily? Um, after 2005, Subaru was in a bind to get numbers for fuel economy and emissions up on these engines. So, uh, part of their issue is your factory tune. Subaru actually ran these engines a little bit leaner than in the previous turbocharged engines. And now if you know much about turbocharged engines, um, turbochargers put a lot of heat into your engine and a way to keep your pistons cool is by adding extra fuel. Um, on turbocharged applications, normally you will run your um, air fuel ratio a little to the rich side. This helps with pre-detonation. This helps cool the combustion chamber. Extra fuel coming in cools the combustion chamber, cools the piston. Um, issue occurs that to get better uh, emissions and better fuel economy numbers, they tune these engines to run leaner. Well, when you start to do a lot of beating on the car, a lot of wide open throttle, a lot of heavy acceleration, the tune that Subaru put into these cars and the later, oh, later model turbocharged engines, it weighted and held fuel back longer before adding it in the higher RPM range. And when you're leaning out, the turbocharged engines, you get a lot of heat build up and you got a lot of problems. So part of the issue, part of the reason why these uh, ringlands were cracking and failing was because the factory tune was ran lean and was causing excess heat and excess stress to the pistons that they had not been receiving in previous models. Um, another issue that caused the problem with the ringlands on these engines was another part of Subaru's factory tune. They had changed some of the parameters for how the engine reacted to engine knock. When engine knock occurs normally, the PCM will dial back timing and adjust your fuel to help with the knock. Well, with the uh, updated tune for the better emissions, with the engine running slightly leaner than it had previously, it also changed when the PCM would intervene during a knock event. So, 
PCM was a little later responding to knock issues and didn't respond quite as strongly to those knock issues. So it wasn't as quick to retard the timing or to add or lessen fuel to um, help with the knock issues. So you had more knock, more pre-detonation, and a leaner fuel mix going into the combustion chamber on the OEM tune at higher RPMs. Another reason we were getting a lot of Ringland failures on these engines. Um, a third reason for these issues on these engines, aftermarket parts without tune support. A lot of guys were running um, cold air intakes, aftermarket exhaust, more air in, more air out without adjusting the tune. The Subaru's turbocharged engine is very sensitive to aftermarket parts. Um, if you put a cold air intake on your WRX STI, um, Legacy GT, Outback XT, Forester XT, you're putting more air into this engine than the PCM is calibrated for. The PCM expects to see, even using the mass air sensor, it expects to see X volume of air, X amount of air flow, and X temperature of air, and uses that for its calculations to add your fuel, spark, adjust your timing. When you add a cold air intake, you're pulling more air, a larger volume most times due to a larger duct. You don't have the bellows that a factory intake has. You don't have the silencers that factory intakes have. You're normally pulling colder, more dense air. The mass air sensor's placement in this intake is different than the factory setup. It doesn't always read as accurately because it is calibrated for the factory intake pipe. Uh, you're already getting less fuel due to the factory emissions stringent tune. So adding more air into an already leaner mixture and doing a lot of wide open throttle pulls, you are creating a lot of heat and issues inside your engine, inside the combustion chamber, a lot more stress on your pistons and everything else going on in your combustion chamber. That's why there's more failures known with aftermarket parts as well. You're throwing off your air fuel mixture. Anything you do on the Subaru engines needs to be tuned by a professional tuner. That's just how you prolong the health of these engines. That's where most of the issues come from. Guys are used to throwing cold air intakes on their Honda Civics or their Camaro or their Trans Am or their Mustang with no issue. But this is a different animal. It needs to know how much fuel air is getting, how much fuel it's getting, and cold air intakes it can't calibrate for. So, number one, factory tune is already running the car slightly leaner for emissions and fuel economy. Not good for turbocharged engines. Number two, knock detection response has been altered. It's not as responsive in the factory tune. Number three, aftermarket power adders bolt on parts leaning out your engine. This entire combination is what causes so many Ringland failures, cracked pistons in the modern turbocharged Subaru engines. So, you want to expand the life of your WRX, your STI, your Legacy GT, your Outback XT, your Forester XT. One, keep it stock. <laughs> I know that's boring to a lot of guys, but if you keep your vehicle stock and well maintained, I've seen these engines go well over 200,000 miles without failures. It's not that it's an inherent issue that they're not reliable. It's a lot to do with how they're cared for and how they're driven. Two, any modifications you do to your vehicle need to be tuned with a proper tune from a professional tuner. Pretty simple. Any modifications you do, tune the car for the modification. So, number two on the list is 
Crack Pistons, Crack Ringlands, Ringland Failure. Number three on the list for failures in EJ255 engines. Rod Bearing Failure. I know it's kind of hard to see here because I am filming on my GoPro and it can't really get detailed up close um, shots with it. But um, you may or not be able to see right here. There's um, quite a bit of scoring on this uh, rod bearing. And there's actually some chunks missing from the bearing material itself. Pretty common issue on the EJ255 engine and EJ257 engine is uh, rod bearing failure or rod knock. Um, if you've watched part one of my video on the Legacy GT project car, you know it has a rod knock right now, uh, rod bearing failure. Uh, the cause of the rod bearing failures, or the main causes of rod bearing failures on the EJ255 engines and 257s um, are the oiling system. Um, main issue just like with the turbocharger, the small capacity oil filter that Subaru started putting on these engines in 2005. Like I said before, I don't have one to show you right now, but the um, previous oil filter was about yay big compared to yay big. So about roughly 40 to 50% more um, filtration uh, ability to filter than this filter. Uh, like I said before, uh, they expanded um, service intervals for oil changes on these cars and these filters with their small size there's a finite amount of material that they can filter before they clog and go into bypass mode. So you're more likely to blow contaminants through your engine, through your oil galleys and they wind up at your bearings and they will contaminate your bearings, stick in your bearings, cause friction. Uh, once you get friction and grit in there, then it's just a matter of time before that friction starts to wear down, eat up, and destroy the bearing. Once the bearing is damaged, the bearing is loose, and your rod will knock because the precision fit between the big end of your connecting rod and the rod journal on the crankshaft is no longer within those tight tolerances is now loose and as the engine runs it wiggles back and forth and the rod end beats on the crankshaft causing the knocking sound. Two, uh, the oil pump. These engines up until I believe 2007 or 2008 ran a 10 millimeter oil pump. In 2007-2008, Suru upgraded the oil pump to an 11 millimeter unit. Um, this was believed to be uh, to help with the demand for oil pressure for the AVCS, the active uh, valve control system with the oil pressure actuated uh, cam pulleys that advanced and retarded timing. But, um, uh, yeah, the larger capacity oil pump is uh, a cheap and effective upgrade when rebuilding these engines. But uh, on the older engines, that was another detriment to the oiling system was the smaller oil pump. Um, the other pretty common uh, issue that you see with these engines and oil pressure is your factory oil pickup. The uh, factory oil pickup bolts here at the bottom of the pickup for the oil pump and bolts to the windage tray here. As you can see this one has some metal shavings and trash in it because this one I believe was off of this engine. But the issue here is that the factory pickup is brazed where the uh, pickup pipe meets the pickup strainer and what can happen over time, uh, heat cycles, and just age. I've seen several cases of this, that uh, this brazing will crack, this pipe will crack, 
and uh, what happens is when that cracks you get uh, air leak essentially and your oil pump starts sucking air instead of liquid oil and uh, when your oil pressure drops you uh, introduce a lot of air into your oil and aerate your oil uh, and can start it to foam and uh, when you have a lot of air introduced and foam foaming frothing of the oil uh, its lubricity is hindered um, a lot of air and a lot of foam oil is not going to lubricate as well as uh, liquid oil will especially under pressure so uh, big upgrade for rebuilding your EJ255 EJ257 engines are to upgrade to like the uh, Killer B oil pickup which is a fabricated uh, welded uh, beefier oil pickup but uh, another common issue with the Subaru oiling system is the factory oil pickup another cause of the issue is a lot of heavy or severe driving uh, again not changing your oil frequently enough when you're doing a lot of uh, wide open throttle driving, a lot of aggressive driving, uh, doing any tracking with the car, anything like that. Anytime you're doing that kind of stuff, you need to change your oil more frequently because that's a severe um, operating condition. So, smaller capacity oil filter from the factory. The longer recommended uh, service interval for oil changes, the smaller uh, oil pump that came on these engines from the factory and the issue with the stock oil pickup cracking. All of these issues come together are a lot to do with why oil starvation happens and these engines can develop rod knocks. Yeah, so how to get a longer life out of your EJ205-257 turbocharged Subaru engines, protect your bearings, and not have rod knocks. Uh, upgrade your oil filter to a larger capacity oil filter or run the older Subaru OE filter with more filtration um, capacity. Uh, change your oil more frequently, 3,000 miles or so. Change your oil even more frequently if you're driving under severe driving conditions. Lots of wide open throttle, uh, tracking the car, autocross events, drag racing, etc or if you do any towing with your vehicle like if you have an Outback XT or a Forester XT if you do towing that's considered severe duty driving more frequent oil changes um, changing out your oil pickup for a stronger stouter uh, Killer B or other brand aftermarket oil pickup upgrading your factory oil pump to the larger 11 millimeter, and if I remember right, I believe the JDM STI offered at some point a 12 millimeter oil pump, but I might be wrong. But another way to help prolong the life of your turbocharged Subaru engine is upgrading to a larger oil pump. So, maintenance is key. Just like anything mechanical, any other car make brand, maintenance is key. How you maintain and take care of your vehicle, your engine, determines how long the service life will be and how um, how reliable and how few or many issues you will have with that vehicle so that concludes the video top three failures for the EJ255 and 257 to a lesser degree engines turbocharger failures ringland failures piston crack issues and rod bearings. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.